I'm now outside the church on the church ramp. It's Mr. Holy Spirit. He's here, look. Good morning to our beautiful STC Church family. And if you're a guest or visitor, just checking us out, a big welcome to you. If we've not met, my name is James and I'm part of the team here at the church. I'm married to Lucy. We've got two kids, Joshua and Florrie, and we so miss meeting with you. But we're praying that as we're in our homes today, ready to meet with God, that his spirit comes and impacts each and every one of us. Um, so do post throughout the gathering in the comments, say hi, say where you're watching from, let us know who you are, we'd love to get to know you, but if you're part of our family as well, we love catching up with you during church, so do write things there, say hello, share prophetic words and prayers, we'd love to be engaging throughout the gathering today. Here's what's coming up, after this brief intro from me, There'll be a family worship song, so get ready to boogie, arms in the air, all that kind of stuff. After which we'll hear some stories of what God's been doing. We'll pray together, worship Jesus, and hear a message from the Bible, which Alan is bringing today, and then we'll respond. Now, last week, Tom, our team leader, shared kind of the Vision Sunday, where we're going as a church in the next couple of months. Part of that, there was a giving form. If you need details on how to give to our church, there's information in the comments below. Follow it through to our website. I'll share more at the end. Let me pray for us as we get stuck into all that God has in store for us today. Now, in the week, Dave Warman, who's a member of our church, if he's in the chat, show a lot of love to Dave, shared these four great truths about God. And I want to just declare them in faith this morning as we say who God is and he talks about God being four G's. Every time I've seen 4G on my phone, kind of like the data signal, I've been remembering these great truths about God. He said, God is great. He is glorious. He is good. And he is gracious. Lord, we say those things about you today. This is our, as we come into worship, God, we remember that you are great. You are glorious, you are good, and you are gracious. We don't need to earn your love today. We don't need to perform for it. You love us because you love us. And as we come to worship you now, God, would our hearts be so full of praise and our lips be so full of thankfulness? And Spirit of God, would you fill each and every home and heart of all of us who are listening today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to our family worship song now and get ready to bust a move. You're doing a new thing, making my heart sing, bringing color to this brand new day. It's never been clearer, you draw me nearer You're always with me and you're here right now My song, a melody You're a perfect love for me My heart is full of praise
Hello everybody, we're at that point in our gathering where we're going to hear stories from what's happening across the church. The first one is with Rob and Emma, who are young adults in our church. The second one is Sam and Karen, who are part of our team. Now the first story, Rob and Emma, they're part of a team that serve in Revive Cafe, a kitchen that runs in the city centre. And Revive's part of Restore Ministries that runs out of our sister church, Philly. And we love what God has been doing there. So with the first one, let's sit back and listen to what they've got to share. Hi everyone, we are Emma and Rob Rice and we help run Revive Cafe. We uh, both came to this city about six years ago. Yeah. Uh, we met in a lecture and then we got married a couple of months ago. Um, and yeah, we've been around STC for about four years now. Amazing. And so for people who might not know, what is Revive? Revive Cafe is a soup kitchen with difference. That's what we call it. It's we aim to not only feed people uh, food, but we also aim to feed them spiritually through conversation. Um, we run out of the Arch Project, which is a homeless initiative that runs during the week at the Sheffield Cathedral. We take over the weekend and we have amazing teams of people uh, during normal times who come and have conversation with people. And if they want to talk about God, we talk about God. But sometimes we just let them talk about the football because that's what they want to talk about. Um, we we realised that it's important to for these people to have a chat because during the week um, it might not be possible for them to, to open up and just chat about what they want to chat about. Mm. And as with a lot of things that kind of had to change and adapt at the moment, how has Revive had to change during covid um, so there are both positive, positives and negatives. Um, yeah, um, so before COVID, we used to source and cook the food ourselves. Um, and like Rob said, we had amazing volunteers who'd show up um, every two weeks. We'd cook the food and we'd have four different groups. Um, so we'd have a prayer team, a welcome team, hosting team and a kitchen team. And um, yeah, we'd serve soup and then we'd sit with um, our guests, our friends um, and have a chat. Um, now it's a bit different because of the restrictions so uh, we run every week now because the, the need there uh, um, though we serve um, a smaller group of people because thankfully a lot of people um, have been um, put into hostels so they're able to get food um, and now it's a case of uh, microwaving pre-prepared food and then taking it to the gate where um, we can hand it over with minimal social contact mm. one of the good things <laughs> sorry <laughs> is um that we uh, maintain this kind of sense of, of peace um, and that's kind of not really stopped over lockdown. 
Mm. That's really good to hear. And I can testify to Rob and Emma's amazing cooking skills and the soups that you used to make. So I'm sure the guests are missing that a bit at the moment. So in amongst the um, challenges and the differences at the moment, what are the good things that you're seeing? What is God doing through Revive? So there are main, two main good things that we see God doing. Uh, the first is that we really feel there's a there's peace over the, the cafe, um, even though it's changed uh, how we run it slightly. Um, during the week, uh, the Arch Project have, have issues with antisocial behaviour, um, which is completely expected given the backgrounds of some of the people that come along. But on a Saturday, there is a, there is a level of peace and a level of calm, um, which is, is a massive godsend because we don't run a homeless project normally. So people not kicking off is, is amazing. We also have the Arch Project cook all of our food. They offered it to us, which means that we can uh, supply food, but not have to have all the people in the kitchen, which means that we can adhere to social distancing more, which the, that offer from them was, was amazing. And it has changed how we don't do things. Um, so, yeah, two, two absolutely amazing things that have come out of it. Mm, that's really encouraging to hear of God's kind of provision and peace in the midst of everything at the moment. And um, so just briefly to end, how can we as a church family be praying for you and the team and revive as a whole? I think first and foremost, we'd love prayer for the health um, and the safety of our volunteers and of our guests. Winter's a tough time anyway, um, and it's just going to get worse in this climate. So, yeah, uh, we pray for their safety and um, secondly we pray for the finances of the Archer project um, they've been doing such an amazing job over lockdown they've pulled together all the brilliant projects in the city um, and, and pulled the volunteers and food and um, yeah fundraising has been difficult this year for them it's been a challenge um, and on top of that of the fire that happened in the Arch project earlier this year um, must have eaten into their budget so yeah prayer for the arch project and the amazing work that it does mm. great yeah those are things that we can definitely be praying for thank you so much for everything that you've shared and for all that you're doing and um, for revive um yeah big thanks to the whole team and the way that you're serving the city of sheffield that's been amazing to hear a bit more about that hey church i hope that you are well um my name's sam this is Karen, um, and we just got a couple of stories that we wanted to share with you to encourage you during this time. Um, so the, the day before national lockdown kicked off um, on the Wednesday in England, um, some of us on the staff team, we went out onto the high street of Crooks just to bless people, um, just to see how they were doing. And we knew that um, in the light of lockdown that people might be really scared and especially the kind of small business owners um, might be anxious and uncertain of what was to come and we just wanted to go out and bless people um, and pray for people so Karen why don't you tell us a little bit about about what happened um, it was actually quite amazing and to be honest I didn't want to go when I got to church on the Wednesday morning and Alan said go out and do this my thought was I shouldn't have come actually <laughs> and then um, anyway I am um, grabbed hold of Monica from church and we both went off up to the shops and in trepidation, to be honest, in trepidation, um, and had the most amazing time. Um, we, the shop, we'd split the shops into groups, so we, um, we popped up and went into shops that I wouldn't normally go into. Um, so we were in the tattooist, amazing reception, amazing reception from the tattooist, um, and, uh, which is not somewhere I go, but you know, I pop in for chat now again, you know, which was really good. Um, so charity shops, flower shops, cafes, um, we yeah, uh, met incredible people and it was just wonderful. That's um, amazing. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, so um, we, Alan furnished us with lots of chocolates. We, we, took, um, we took them in and people were bowled over. Absolutely um, just so surprised because it was the day before lockdown started and they and and the atmosphere around was not great but um the thing we found mostly was that people cared about the community and they were concerned about the people who walked past the shops and the people who popped in just to say although we never bought anything um 
and we were worried about um, sort of offering to pray for people who might not receive it well and we were just really humbled um, at how they did receive us and um, and we said what is there anything you know we really would like to pray for you if that's all right and they they nearly everyone said yes and they said we'd like prayer that we don't lose have to lose staff um that we still uh, can keep going that the community thrives still and that's what we prayed for we prayed mm -hmm. for these things and um, we were offered free coffees we were just blessed it was humbling really humbling yeah, we found exactly the same thing as well. It was amazing that um, everyone that we spoke to was just so receptive and so kind and considerate. And um, we found that every, everyone that we spoke to was willing to be prayed for. Um, and that was just that was really amazing and really encouraging. Um, and actually, we, we, we wanted to share this with you because at the end of lockdown, we're hoping to go back onto Crooks High Street and visit some of the shops that we um, went to before to find out how they've been getting on um, and to hear if there's been any answers to prayer, really, um, and just an opportunity to encourage and to bless them again. So where you where you are in your local high streets, um, we wonder if you could do the same. Um, it's an opportunity to get out and to, um, to bless people and to offer to pray for people. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to encourage you this morning. So thank you, Karen. Okay, thanks, Sam. Good morning, church. My name's Sarah. I'm a student at STC. Um, I study music and I'm in third year. I'll be doing the prayers today, a really simple structure, saying thank you, sorry, and please. Teaspoon prayers. Um, but first, if you would like to get into a comfortable praying position, whether that's sitting down or kneeling, we're just gonna take a few moments to still ourselves before God and acknowledge his presence with us. The Bible calls us to give thanks in all circumstances and to praise God's name. So we're now going to have some time giving thanks to God and remembering um, some things we're grateful for. And if you'd like to say out loud or type in the comments some things you're grateful for, I'm going to leave some space for that now. God, thank you so much that you are with us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for the wonders of technology that we can meet online. Thanks for this awesome church community, for my friends and my family. Thank you that I ate breakfast this morning and that you have provided for me in so many areas of my life. Amen. We're now gonna to move to a time of saying sorry um, uh, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to invite you to call to mind um, and say out loud um, some things you'd like to say sorry to God for in this space now. God, I'm sorry for when I've ignored you. Sorry for the times I've not trusted you. Sorry for thinking more often than I'd like to admit that I know how to live my life best and that I know better than you do. God, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, collectively, God, we repent. We acknowledge our need for you and we receive your forgiveness again. Amen. Now we're going to move on to a time of praying and asking God for things we might need in our lives and the lives of people around us. Um, and by prayer and petition, we're called to um, present our requests to God. So let's do that now.
God particularly on my heart at the moment are students who are planning to go home in the next few weeks. I pray for safe travel for them, for motivation as they continue to their studies at home and online. Um, I pray that home would be a place where they can relax and be fully rested before the new term. Pray for students who are needing to stay at university because they have a job or because home is not a happy place. I pray for fun and joy for them, God, in this festive period. I pray for hope and for comfort and I pray against despair and restlessness in Jesus' name. I pray for everyone who is suffering and struggling with mental health at the moment. God, would you provide hope again? Help us, your church, um, to provide creative solutions um, for our own mental health and for the people around us. Help us to be a light in these dark times. Now I'm going to fi finish with a blessing from the end of 2 Thessalonians. So Church Sheffield, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Come, see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. So heal of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain above. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken in life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. And you've been faithful through every storm. And you'll be faithful forevermore. You will do great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. And so, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken a lie. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. And hallelujah, and hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things, oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We 
dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Be my 
prayer of our hearts, Lord. That we'd worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, and that you would be magnified and glorified in all that we do. In all we say, in our actions, in our words, in our deeds. Be glorified and magnified, Jesus. In your name we pray. Good morning and welcome to church. My name is Alan and I'm part of the staff team here and it is my great, great privilege to be speaking to us this morning. It's been a great week. Last, last week, Tom shared on Vision and Commitment Sunday. It was a great message for us as we head into what could be a really exciting season for the church. So if you've not watched it yet, if you've not had a chance, do check it out on Facebook or check our YouTube channel. Do watch it. It's a brilliant, brilliant message. Sunday was followed by Monday. It's just the way of things. And Monday evening was a training evening for cell and cluster leaders and for the future leaders of sixes. And the feedback from both of these events last Sunday and Monday has been overwhelmingly positive. So on to today. We're continuing our teaching theme through the autumn term, transition time, embracing the new normal. And as you know, we've been making our way first through Colossians, and more recently through Philippians. And today we reach Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 21. And as ever, I love a title or two. Um, today I have but one, but the title is, ready for it? The Monkey Trap. The Monkey Trap. And all of that will become clear in a little while. And as ever, if you've got alternative suggestions for today's uh, talk, then do put them in the feed. I'd love to hear them. But before we get started, I would love to ask us a little question to get us thinking. And as Tom did last week, uh, and as we did in the week, I'm going to give you a little bit of time, three minutes or so, to have a chat with those that you're watching with, or to text, or to call a friend, uh, and uh, give you a little bit of space to answer this question. So here it is. Are you ready? Sit back. Here we go. What do you love? Now, not the surface level kind of love, chocolate or football, more like the things you love that make life worth living. The things we love that give us a sense of value, of purpose. Yes, I know it's only early. It's a big question to start the day, but there's no apology from me. Let's crack on. Three minutes. Chat to those around you. Message someone. See you in a minute.
Brilliant. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you've had time to process the question, what do you love? What's that thing that makes life worth living, that gives you value, that helps you get out of bed in the morning? I want you to hold that thought as we look at today's passage, Philippians 3, verses 7 to 21. Bit of context before we jump in. Remember, Paul is in prison. He has enemies, people who are trying to stir up trouble for him. And Paul does Uh, sit under the threat of death. He may be executed if upcoming uh, time in court doesn't go to his favour. So at the start of chapter three, just before our reading today, Paul tells the Philippian church to rejoice. He then issues a warning against those who are teaching and trying to lead them astray. Those who are demanding that they be circumcised who claim to be right with God, that the Philippian church need to mark their bodies and to keep a whole load of religious laws. These false teachers boast because they think that they are all that, that they're special, that they're a cut above, that they're cooler than the rest of the crowd. And then that leads Paul to do something out of character. He boasts. He says they have reason to think themselves special, I have more reason to boast. And then he goes on to list his credentials. Circumcised, yep, done the right way on the eighth day. Right family, oh yeah. Worked hard at keeping the Jewish laws, yep, I'm a Pharisee. The strictest, most devoted, most hardcore in all of those who seek to keep and to follow the Jewish way of life. Passionate, uh uh-huh, to the point of persecuting those who don't believe what he believed. Faultless, faultless in following his religion. All things, all these things were things that people around him would love, would make life worth living, would give a sense of value and self-esteem. All stuff that can make people think that they are just a cut above. So let's have a look now and see what Paul has to say. Philippians 3 verses 7 to 21. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have uh, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 2,000 years ago, in a strict religious culture, what made you cool? Circumcision, your family tree, being religious, keeping the religious law perfectly. That was 2000 years ago. And I wonder what would be the markers for us in Sheffield in the 21st century? 
the right church, maybe, a good job, a university degree or two or three, or perhaps a large following on social media, engagement with our latest post, the right phone, the right label on our clothes, the right friends, being the one who goes the furthest or the quickest, who takes the most steps each week. We all love stuff. And there's plenty in our culture that we all assign value and worth to that makes us feel good or forms a grid through which we rate people or look down on them. Am I right? And none of these things are wrong in and of themselves, the trappings of the society. And as I've been reading and thinking and putting all of this together, I happened to crop upon this quote from Timothy Keller. He puts it this way. What thing, if you lost it, would almost mean that you would lose the will to live? What thing lost, gone from your life, would mean, would mean that almost all value and significance, identity and worth, would be drained out of your life? Whatever that thing is, the Bible calls it an idol. It's an alternative God, a counterfeit God. Anything that is more fundamental to your happiness, sense of value or identity, other than God. Amazing quote. So no, none of these things are wrong. The phone, the degree, um, the friends, the label, they might just occupy a position, a priority in our lives that perhaps they shouldn't. Just breathe, smile, it'll be okay, God thinks you're pretty special. In fact, so damn awesome that he designed an elaborate plan a couple of thousand years in the making, resulting in Jesus dying on a cross so that you and me might have God, our loving Father, come and live in us to begin a work of transformation in us. And his promise is that over time, that work of transformation will be completed. We are all, all all of us a work in progress, even the wonderful Mary Foote well into her 10th decade, a work in progress. But as a work in progress, we have God in our corner. More than that, he's in our heads and our hearts. He gives us strength, he refines us, shows us, teaches us. It's him who trains us if we let him. So that's enough, really. There's plenty there to really chew on. But I want to pause and I want to tell you a story. I want to remind you of the title, The Monkey Trap. So a story about a monkey. And I hope that this will illustrate something of what I'm trying to get out and help us to really wrestle with what I believe that God is saying to us this morning. So here we go. If you're sitting comfortably, I will begin. In a far-off land, there lived a naughty monkey. Well, he was just a monkey and he needed to eat. But he didn't know how to plant. He didn't know how to grow stuff. He didn't have any money. So he would feed himself the only way that was open to him. He would steal from his village. And so he did. He stole a lot. He was quite a greedy monkey. The villagers tried and tried to catch the monkey. They hid with nets, they dug pits, they set traps. But try as they might, they couldn't catch monkey. But then one day, when the town was in total uproar because monkey had broken into the village supplies and had uh, that the villagers had laid up for winter, on that very day, a stranger wandered into town. Ooh. The stranger was wise. And the stranger knew a thing or two about the strength and power and depth of love. So the stranger whispered in the ear of a passing villager, I can catch the monkey. No one can catch the monkey, the villager replied. Bring me a glass jar with a narrow entrance and a strong handle, said the stranger, and a length of rope. Soon the items were assembled and a small crowd had gathered. The stranger looked them over and nodded. Perfect. The stranger took the glass jar with a narrow neck and he tied it by the strong handle with the rope to a large tree in the middle of the village. The stranger called for a banana and dutifully a banana came. It was brought to him, passed over. 
The stranger squeezed the banana through the narrow neck into the jar and dismissed the crowd. And then later that evening, along came Monkey. Monkey spied the glass jar. Monkey sniffed the air. Banana, Monkey's favourite. Monkey looked around, really suspicious. There was no one in sight. Monkey sniffed again. Not even the faintest smell of human. So Monkey approached the jar, alert for the faintest sound. But there was only silence. Scanning for traps, looking for nets, nothing. Monkey squeezed Monkey's hand into the jar, grasped the banana in Monkey's fist and... Monkey was trapped. Monkey pulled, Monkey twisted, Monkey howled, Monkey cried. But no matter what Monkey did, Monkey couldn't get free. You see, with Monkey's hand gripped tight around the banana, Monkey's fist was too big to pull back out through the narrow entrance of the jar. The hours passed and Monkey grew desperate. Monkey struggled, Monkey pulled and pushed and twisted and kicked. All through the night, Monkey tried, but Monkey would not let go of the banana. The next morning, the villagers awoke and there was quite a commotion in the middle of the village. They began to gather. The stranger who knew the strength and power and depth of love spoke up and said it and spoke aloud. Monkey loves banana. All Monkey had to do was to let go of the one thing Monkey loved and Monkey would have been free. Monkey was carried far. Monkey was released because this is a friendly, child-friendly story. And the villagers thought on what the stranger had said. All Monkey had to do was to let go of the one thing Monkey loved and Monkey would be free. And this morning wherever you are, just want you to consider, are we any different? Because love is strong. Love is powerful. It's a deep and powerful force, stronger than our thoughts, stronger than logic. And our love gropes around looking for something to latch onto. And when our love lights on something it fancies, it locks on and it is really hard to let go. Paul says in verse 19, their God is their stomach, their stomach, their appetites, their desires, their loves. He goes on to say their minds are set on earthly things. And you know it's exactly the same for every one of us. Our habits, our desires, our jobs, our security, our loved ones, even our loved ones long departed, our grudges, our pain, our prestige, our hearts lock on to the things of this world. They can lock on, latch on, and we can become unable to let go and to be free. Back to the passage, Paul says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, our God is a jealous God. He wants to be first in our affections. But this isn't for his benefit. This is for our benefit because he wants us to be free. And so when we love him above all other things, when our worth, our identity, our love fixes and clings to him first, everything else falls into its proper place. Augustine of Hippo, a great name and a great title, I'm sure you'll agree, writing on prayer said this, our heart's loves are disordered. Things we ought to love third or fourth are first in our hearts. And God, whom we should love supremely, is someone we may acknowledge, but whose favour and presence is not existentially as important to us as prosperity, success, status, love and pleasure. And unless we at least recognise this heart disorder and realise how much it distorts our lives, our prayers will be part of the problem. 
You see, loving bananas or whatever it is for us is not wrong. But God has to be first. Jesus said the greatest commandment is this, love God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all of this other stuff that the heart desires. All this will be given to us. And you know what? It will take its rightful place in our lives. So, coming into land, what do we love? What are we clinging to? What has this crazy COVID season revealed to us? What has transition as church, the talk of sixes, brought to the surface in our lives? What has been shaken? What's gone that gave us a sense of value, of worth, of rootedness, of who we were? Is it time that we come before our Father? Is it time that we poured out our hearts to him, cried our tears, mourned what we have lost, recognised the things we love most are the hardest to let go of? Some years ago, my mum died. It was a really tough, tough season in our lives. Helen was pregnant and I did some serious damage to my shoulder. We had rats die beneath our dining room floor, resulting in maggots and flies and a pervading stench of death. We were overrun with fleas. I'd left a job. And in that moment, I remember that there was a passage in the Psalms, just a short phrase, Psalm 118 verse five. And the newer versions, the newer NIV translations phrase it differently. But in my old Bible, it said this, in my anguish, I cried to the Lord and he answered by setting me free. It was a tough time, but we as a family came through it. And I believe that God taught us a lot, brought us into a greater place of freedom. Still a work in progress, but a powerful, powerful time in our lives. And for many of us, this time is tough, tougher than we could ever have possibly imagined. But God is here. He is in this and he will see us through. Sometimes we need to let go to be free, to accept that what has gone is gone and it isn't coming back. Sometimes we need to have our fingers prized off our bananas because we won't let it go on our own. But as we do, we will encounter God in the midst of it all. We will grow, we will mature, we will fall more and more deeply in love with the Father. Jesus' great love for us will grow in our own hearts and we will be free. And in the meantime, as Paul writes in verse 16, let us live up to what we've already attained. Let's look out for one another. Let's encourage and cheer each other on. Let's not look only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let's never grow weary in doing good. And as I was thinking and praying through this message, I happened upon this prayer and it seems fitting somehow. It's the prayer of serenity used by the AA. Let's pray it together as we finish this morning. Let's pray. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. Amen. Amen. Church, it's great to see you this morning. Have a great week. We'll see you all soon. See you. Hello again. Just want to say a big thank you for being part of church this morning. We have loved it. Now, before we finish, just want to remind you that there is a giving form in the link below. Tom shared about our Vision Sunday last week. If we've been praying about how we can join in financially with all that God is doing in our church, all the details we'll need 
is in that uh, website link below. And if you're new, if you've joined our church since the summer, you've been waiting for an opportunity to join in and give, everything you'll need to know will be in that link at the bottom. Do be praying about how we can give during this time. Now, let me pray for us as we finish our gathering today. Lord, thank you for all that we've seen, all that we've heard, and for all that we've been able to join in with as a church this morning. We remember that we're part of a global church, people meeting all over the world today, but also we're part of this church family here in Sheffield. And I thank you, God, for each and every one of us. As we go into this week, let's go with these words ringing in our ears. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Church, have a fantastic week and we'll see you at 10.30 next week as we start the season of Advent. We'll see you then.